Hello, everyone. I'm Angela Black. Welcome to the show. This show is called At This Moment here on Studio B every Thursday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. And that translates into 7 p.m. Pacific. Uh, so in whichever time zone on the globe that you exist, do tune into my show, darn it, especially if I unhit the mute button or whatever. <laughs> so. Uh, tonight's guest is W, the Intelligence Insider, and I'm really looking forward to a great conversation. It should be a fast ride. Uh, please do strap your seatbelts on because uh, I'm really looking forward to um, learning a lot about a lot. Right now, I know a little about a lot, uh, but W knows a lot about a lot, and I'm really looking forward to having this conversation with him. And I even promise to technically handle my situation. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So anyway, yes, uh, we're going to be talking about all sorts of things that are, you know, top, top priority on the globe right now, including things like Jade Helm, things like China and the uh, imminent possible. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I can say imminent and possible in the same breath. Possible imminent war. There you go. <laughs> Is that like military intelligence or jumbo shrimp? I'm not really sure. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave the whole spiel about uh, donating to the station, and none of you caught that either. So, again, I'll tell you quickly about the uh, seed packs. So for the $60 donation, there is an awesome seed pack. For the $100 most popular one-time donation, you can receive uh, up to 35,000 seeds. I think, I think it's like 34,500 seeds of non-GMO, non-hybrid seeds. And uh, I believe it's the way to go. The $100 donation is the most popular. There's also a $200 donation, and you get the community garden seed pack. So that's awesome. I don't know. I think it has like five bazillion seeds or something along those lines. Don't quote me on that. And then, of course, you, you can subscribe to the archives <sighs> because it is impossible to listen to both Studios A and B, unless, of course, one of them is muted. <laughs> wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, ah. All right. It's a good thing W is not here yet. <laughs> I got to like, you guys, I got to pretend I'm awesome right now <laughs> and informed and that I know how to technically run my own show. All right. So anyway, yes. And also subscribe to the archives. Yes, because you can't listen to both studios A and B at all times and have a life. And um, uh, that's why you sub should subscribe to the archives. Wow. <laughs> I hope you're all enjoying this. I feel like I'm having one of those moments where I had like a wardrobe malfunction or something. <laughs> I had a radio w w wardrobe malfunction. Yeah, the mute button. That's the new thing. It's uh... <laughs> okay. So anyway, I'm breathing and I do expect a call coming in shortly from W, the intelligence insider. And at that point, we will uh, have an official awesome show as opposed to me babbling about how I can't speak on a radio. <laughs> Okay, what else? Um, I hope all of you are doing very well. I just wanted to let you know that uh, I, uh, I'm i well. Um, my, I went to the doctor and uh, found out my blood is looking really good since I quit that sauce. So um, I'm very excited about that. I've been sober for almost a year. I had a little break in there where I drank some red wine last, uh, last uh, November and December. It was the holidays. What can I say? But anyway, then I requit, and uh, my blood is like swimmingly awesome now. So I'm really excited about that. And I just thought I'd share that little bit of information. And what else? I don't have much with me right now because I'm still reeling from the fact that I'm I'm all flush. You know, you just can't tell, but I'm blushing. I'm 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 a little hot under the collar, etc. So <laughs> let me see what's going on on Skype really quick. Okay. Oh, you're funny. Brian Porter is listening in and tells me that I need a producer. <laughs> Okay, great. And I just found out that um, we have W uh, coming in at, at about, let's see, 15 after. So he'll be calling sh shortly. And uh, <laughs> Ken Keeling, you're very funny. I uh, I cannot repeat that on the air. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what else? Uh, we've got the archives. We've got the seed packs. Uh, and, oh, by the way, Mr. Rowe, uh, I, I heard a little bit of your show and I wanted to tell you hello and uh, you, you do an awesome job. I'm so glad that you're a new host here on Revolution Radio and also my fluffer. And uh, yes, I had a dream and you were in it last night and you were even in that hat that's on your icon on Facebook. Yeah. Um, so Mr. Rowe was in my dream. I don't remember much else, but I, I remember there was like some, oh gosh, I don't know, tackle moment. We had to tackle some task 
And uh, we were working together, and uh, we were trying to get stuff done. That's all I remember, Mr. Rowe. <laughs> okay, what else? How's everyone doing in the chat room, you guys? <laughs> oh, my God. I think this is one of, my, one of those moments. Like, I usually don't have this moment, and today I am having that moment in front of you. Again, it's my, it's my radio wardrobe malfunction called the mute button. It's very exciting. And uh, anyway, I hope I hope W calls any second now to save me because I was not uh, really ready for uh, anything else. I could pull up some articles. You know, uh, I do want to send my heart out to let's I'm going to get serious right now. Here we go. Thank God. Thank God, you guys. Here we go. All right, everyone. Welcome, W, the Intelligence Insider, to the call today. Welcome to the show, and thank you for saving me. Hello, W. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> I'm okay. I, I uh, was suffering from uh, technical mute syndrome, and uh, so I, I think I got to go to like Big Pharma and find a pill for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was yeah. broadcasting for about mm, seven, eight minutes. <laughs> oh man! Well, it's okay. I was ready to come on earlier, and then uh, our our friend said that uh, I should hold off until we got a little further into the show, and so I was holding off. And then she sent me an urgent message. She's ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very nice to uh, meet you again. We had a quick hello on V's show one day, but other than that, we've really never uh, had the pleasure. So um, no. thank you for joining me, and uh, it's nice to meet you, W. Yeah. Great. Um, so, I, you know, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, you know, I, I don't really have a something super specific for your listeners today, and I think it's a good time of the year to do some catch up because we're coming into this dark period in the summer. Everybody's busy and preoccupied. It's a great time to just kind of revisit all the things that are happening and have happened. And as the stage is being set for whatever's just ahead. So, you know, just as a, as a thought from my end, but uh, go ahead and ask away, you know, a little bit about me and, and, you know, maybe you've got questions or your listeners have already that, uh, uh, you know, I'm ready. Okay, uh, great. I'm bracing myself. Okay, Get great. Me. And so am I. I've got my seatbelt on. Uh, so I'm excited because, uh, you know, well, let me start with how long have you been, uh, you know, using the the nickname or whatever, the username Intelligence Insider? Let's, let's tell people a little bit about your background and how you ended up uh, on, say, this show today. <laughs> well, I think somebody else picked that for me. I just um, have uh, a very eclectic history, mm -hmm. uh, just about 40 years now, um, working in various programs and, and operations that uh, uh, government, business, industry, etc., that uh, relate to the world affairs um, that, you know, kind of shape the direction of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it related to uh, the economic uh, things. I was um, uh, involved in the operation when we uh, did certain types of transactions that gave us money to be part of upsetting the ruble and uh, uh, those events that led to the collapse of the ruble and collapse of the uh, wall, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the Russian economy um, uh, at the tail end of the Reagan administration, beginning of the Bush administration. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, very rough, generic background. I've, I've done an awful lot of work. Uh, I don't really talk about it because most of it is um, still not stuff that we can really discuss with precision. And so I tend to discuss it a little more generically. I have discussed the um, activities that led to taking down the uh, Berlin Wall to, to, to collapse in the Soviet economy a little more openly. Wow. But part of my, my logic in that, even though it um, greatly annoys some parties, is that uh, the only people that don't really know or understand this how this was done 
are really the American people, or in some cases, you know, maybe European or Japanese people whose economies we used. Um, the Russians certainly do know precisely what happened and how it was done now, looking back. Uh, uh, the other governments or economies around the world are very aware. Um, it's uh, the average guy here that may not understand what was done in their name and then what the possible ramifications fallout are moving forward, uh, you know, for our society, our economy. Uh, uh, you know, let's put it this way. They learned, they went to school on what we did, and it's, uh, I've often told people in some of the meetings that we do, money is like uh, water sloshing in a tub. And when you throw a bunch of money out in one particular direction, it finally reaches a point where the momentum ends and then it sloshes back. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the monetary instruments that we used, uh, which remember, it's really at the end of the day, it's all paper. It's just paper. The currency, the bonds, the dots and tittles on a computer screen. It's just imaginary. And uh, so when you throw a whole bunch out there, it comes back you know, in droves, uh, it comes back in multiples. And so a lot of what we're seeing hitting the economies around the world right now is really repercussions, fallout, uh, the return side of all of the economic activity that we engaged in to, to take out the Russians in what I consider to be the culmination of World War III. We talk about that the world's coming to a moment with, you know, the next world war. Okay, so what world war would we number this? Oh, World War Three. No, I call it World War Four. Hmm. World War Three, we won. Interesting. Interesting. <clears throat> and that has or to be continuation and that goes... of three the next day. So you know I, I say so. Three point one. <laughs> three point two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Three point two. World War three point two. That sounds about right. Well, and so uh, is there anything else uh, information-wise that you can give me and the audience uh, how you were involved with taking down, uh, you know, the ruble and, uh, and, and, and Russia and that entire thing? Is there anything else that you can, that you can tell me? And well, just a few I, thousand just, listeners. <laughs> in, in just the most rudimentary sense, what we did is we used uh, various types of uh, monetary instruments. Okay. Uh, uh, that were generated out of um, uh, agreements with uh, the Fed. And those monetary instruments, which are just paper, their promises to pay back stuff or to take a certain interest uh, rate on a transaction, and we had deposited them in banks in various countries, primarily uh, Japan, uh uh, a bunch of stuff in marks, but those ended up being in other places, uh, Brazil, for example, or Panama. Um, and then when you deposit these large sums of money, I mean hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, even billion dollars, uh, billions of dollars a day, then those banks that have these um, monetary instruments denominated in dollars that becomes uh, essentially a uh, uh, good as gold deposit in these foreign bank accounts. Then their Federal Reserves uh, will honor, uh, uh, they say, well, you've got uh, deposits in your bank of, just for the sake of discussion, a billion dollars. So now you can go to the reserve window in your country, say, for example, Japan, and they can give you a multiple of uh, 10 times that in a loan today. Now, all of a sudden, instead of just having a billion dollars of dollars on deposit in your bank, you're using that billion dollars deposit as security to go get a loan from your uh, local Fed in yen for a dollar equivalent of 10 billion plus dollars. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you have cash to do things with. Now, I'm your best friend because I put a billion dollars in your account. And I say, hey, by the way, because I did that, I need you to make a loan to this company in Korea that's going to make a steel mill. And I need you to make a loan to this company in Vietnam 
that's going to uh, buy some airplanes or renovate a runway. And uh, by the way, I also need to make a deposit uh, with this Indonesian company uh, for some services that you're going to buy. And next thing you know, that number's come down by 20, 25%. And then some of that money magically vaporizes uh, and shows up in other accounts. And now I have a billion dollars, $2 billion of money that I never went to Congress mm-hmm. to go do an operation with. I never had to get uh, senators to agree to approve a black budget. It's all off the budget. I see. And uh, the original money is a uh, loan that's going to be repaid to the Treasury. And so even that's not necessarily technically being reported anywhere in Congress. So at the end of the day, now with that black budget, I can do incredible things. And, And you have to kind of think about well, how big can you really be? I mean, is this just a flea fart or is this something, you know, far more, you know, incredibly large? Well, it was big enough to take out one of the largest economies in the world. Wow. So, um, and it was part of the greater operation during the Reagan administration, uh, you know, the evil empire. We... Uh, attacked them on multiple fronts. The, 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 the three primaries, there's really four, but even the guys inside don't necessarily construct it this way. We engaged them on the religious uh, side, uh, mm-hmm. assisted the uh, uh, Vatican, uh, of course, lots of Catholics throughout uh, the Western uh, countries there in in. Uh, uh, Europe and uh, Poland, especially with Walensa and, and the uh, unions, uh, a very churched crowd, the Pentecostals, uh, uh, the Jews that we uh, were able to get uh, back to Israel and things like that. We engaged them on this religious moral war mm-hmm. about whether it was right to keep people isolated as they as they did. Then we engaged them <clears throat> on the uh, uh, military front. We engaged them in Afghanistan. We engaged them in South America um, with the whole Sandinista thing, uh, running our troops in through Honduras to support and train uh, uh, the rebels to uh, try to, you know, get a uh, control back in Nicaragua, and uh, we we were being engaged in South America at the same time in a drug war, both with the Russians and the Chinese, who were using the drug money to uh, finance their takeovers of governments in South America, and, and because the American people were really not did not have any stomach to get back involved in a jungle war like we had in Southeast Asia, they didn't want to hear about know about have anything to do with actually engaging these communist forces uh, throughout South America. Um, And so the war that we conducted there was really a covert war. And that comes back to the whole Iran-Contra, Ali North, all of those activities in engaging the uh, drug lords and the drug trade in South America. And I I will add... um, we made the five big drug kingpins in Colombia. We centralized the whole drug trade in South America. And uh, that whole operation was tied into um, our uh, engaging Russia and China to push them back and not allow them to get a strong foothold in South America. Uh, you know, one of the themes that I think is really important for your listeners to understand there's so much that takes place just out of your sight. And I I was on a ship a while back with a number of folks, and I I put it this way. I said, you know, you look out, we're on the fan tail of the ship, a fairly large one. And uh, I said, you look out and you see the seagulls and you see the uh, clouds and a couple of boats here and there on the surface of the water. And if you look straight down in the water, you can see a porpoise or two. You could maybe see a sea turtle or something right at the top. But 
you can only see a couple of feet down under the surface or something breaking the surface, and that's it. But just a few hundred feet, a football field away underneath us, or if we moved out a little further at sea, maybe it'd be 10 football fields or 20. But the amount of activity, the amount of life and, and doings, goings on there is just almost beyond comprehension, but it's just out of sight. It's only a few feet from you. Mm-hmm. But you can't see past the surface. And the further down you go, the greater the depths you go to, reaching these deep sea floors, the stranger and wilder and more bizarre the sea life and life forms become. Well, as you go deeper and deeper into the black ops world, into the doings between governments and companies and agencies in the workings of the world, it does become extremely exotic and bizarre because of the conditions you're working in. And a lot of things that at the surface might appear pretty straightforward and simple. As you get deeper, it becomes more convoluted, a little less easy to say that's a good guy and that's a bad guy. And this is something that's important and valuable and that's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's part of this sophistication that most of the people around the world, not just Americans, they have the luxury of not having to be Um, stressed, confused, uh, figuring out all these things, or at least that's the way they feel. And so they do not uh, labor themselves with these, you know, strange doings. But the reality is it does affect your lives. And sometimes um, it can get out of control. It can take directions that you never realized. And for all of the wisdom of the masters that shape the world around you and control it, um, they make mistakes. They're still human, even if sometimes they don't want to admit it. And we live with the consequences of it because at some level we are engaged in a for real war, a, a real drama just out of sight that is this potential life and death struggle that on a moment's notice in a, in a simple turn could change everything mm-hmm. for us um, very permanently. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and the surface that you're to which you're referring is, you know, these are the politicians. These are just actors. These are really, you know, these are um, the puppets that uh, that the general population can pay attention to. Um, it's, it's a theater that kind of exists so that uh, our, t- our attention is diverted from uh, anything deeper, the actual goings on that are really moving, uh, you know, situations, countries, banks, uh, you know, planetary concerns, environmental war, et cetera. Um, you know, so it's it's. And, and then, and it's hard for I think the general population to. Well, I, I don't know if it's hard for. They've been really trained to uh, view everything through a screen now, and and it's almost uh, the line between you know quote unquote actors and theater and advertising, and then that the line between that and say politicians and. Um, uh, you know, banks, et cetera, you know, that line is very blurry for, I would go with, you know, a good 90, you know, 5% of the population. People aren't, people are not aware of what's going on, um, you know, below the surface, as you put it. And, uh, and it, it, you know, and I'm, I'm not that far from that. I, I, you know, I'm still one of those people that's, you know, I'm not informed, uh, uh, to the level that I probably should be. You know, I don't think a lot of us are, you know, there's, and what I was saying before you got here was that you're a guy, the little that I do know about you and what you uh, what you um, bring to the the uh, broadcast uh, situation is that uh, you know y- you know a lot you W the intelligence insider know a lot about a lot of things whereas I I point out that I know a little about a lot of things and so I I really appreciate you joining me today and um, I I with all of that oh, so you were talking about the three and possibly four points that were the uh, ways to take down. 
um, you know, uh, Russia and uh, and that and, and China. I believe was you were kind of referring to both. Well, we didn't. It wasn't so much China at that time. Okay. There was other things that happened with China, but okay. you know, we did it on a religious moral front. Uh huh. The military we did it front. With the monetary. Uh, we did it by the military with the uh, Afghanistan and South America, causing them to have to spend real hard money uh-huh. to engage those places in these proxy conflicts uh-huh. where they were engaged, you know, one foot removed, one step removed with us. We uh-huh. were supplying intermediaries to engage them and sap their lives, sap their funds, keep them, you know, tied down. And uh, so when we added in the monetary, uh, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, Ultimately, we flooded their economy with Western currencies, uh, including the dollar primarily, and then uh, got them hooked on dollars. That's the whole glass thing. And then spending money, uh, buying cars, everything else, keeping their girlfriends happy. And then we pulled the rug out from underneath them, and and what we took in exchange for those dollars were rubles. We didn't counterfeit anything. (laughs) We brought rubles. Allowed their economy to live high on the hog uh, on essentially free money. We we could have sent guns and bullets and warriors at them, but we sent uh, dollars over there, and they gave us rubles in exchange, just paper. But when we sent those rubles back, and started buying stuff with those rubles covertly in the in the markets, which we didn't do ourselves precisely. We did through proxies, intermediaries, um, essentially the mob, Yeltsin's people, etc. Uh, their economy just shut down. The ruble went down in value forty percent in four months. Yeah, it went uh, um, technically. On the black market was greater than that because on the black market, uh, uh, at the beginning of the turn, immediately after Reagan left office and Bush came into office, really a couple of weeks before, we started uh, uh, shifting, not sending hard currencies in and and sending in rubles instead. And their uh, ruble value on the black market went from 40 rubles to the dollar to 200 rubles to the dollar at which point Gorbachev picked up the phone and called Bush one and said, uncle, and what do we got to do? And Bush one said, well, uh, Reagan told you what the deal was. If you want our help, you got to take down the wall and, uh, open the wall is what he said. And, and of course, within an hour, the guards were walking away from the wall and the rest is history. Wow. So, uh, but, but part of what, what makes this important today uh-huh. that all of your listeners should actually be aware of, and maybe it would catch their attention more, at some level, maybe that sounds like old history and interesting and everything else. Okay, so how do we make it current? What was the one thing that really wasn't well understood at the time, but affected all of your listeners, it may have cost some of your listeners their job, their livelihood, their home. Back in the 80s, when we engaged the Russians, we collapsed the price of oil. Now, in the early 80s, we allowed the oil prices to go higher and higher. We made it look like there was peak oil. There's no more oil going to be. It's, it's history. Got all the investors in the world upset and excited. Backing the Russians, who had really the greatest oil fields uh, known at that time, uh, number one oil producer, and they started building these huge drilling projects and and refinery projects, etc. So, you know, to do this takes literally years and years and years, you know, a decade or more. Once we got them sucked into doing this and committing huge amounts of money and capital and resources to to build out these oil fields across all the Kazans and uh, southern Russia and, and these various areas, once they got pretty committed, then we collapsed the price of oil, collapsed it to the ground. Mm-hmm. In the course of doing that, we nearly took out Texas. If you remember when we collapsed the oil prices with the assistance of the Saudis. <laughs> wow. I, you know, I go ahead, please. Well, 
remember, it was so devastating that uh, Texas, we had to pump in other types of money to Texas through other programs uh, that we got Congress to approve just to kind of sustain it, keep it going, when all of a sudden you didn't even pay to pump the oil out of the ground because we took the world oil prices and and created this flood of oil. It was, it was mostly done with uh, um, maneuvering uh, that was planned out through the first term of the Reagan administration to set them up for this fall and take them out to engage them in an asymmetric war, not tank to tank, fighter jet to fighter jet, nuclear missile to nuclear missile, but to engage them asymmetrically in places that, you know, strained them but where we would be strong enough, we were strong enough as a country and an economy to absorb the hit that Texas took. I see. Yeah. Okay. And to help them through. But we couldn't tell everybody that, uh, by the way, the reason that the oil thing is going south is because actually all of those people are warriors. And they have been sacrificed in this war because while it may be horrible and painful and awful, the option is someday your kid's going to have to go out with a rifle and point it at the head of a Russian and try to blow his head off before the Russian aims his rifle at your kid and tries to blow his head off. We engaged them economically, morally, spiritually. We engaged them in ways that uh, were a form of war, but not necessarily total war. And that was the genius of Reagan. And that was the decisiveness with which he decided to engage them in a way that would resolve the conflict sooner and be the best ultimately and save life for both sides. Not that it wasn't hard, but we had the financial depth, the financial strength to win that financial war with the least casualties. Mm -hmm compared to their situation, and we sucked them in to make some decisions. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when the money was flowing, the money would go to Gorbachev's people, but it would also go to Yeltsin's people when he wasn't even in office yet. And over time, the money disproportionately being bled in at better rates to the Yeltsin mob allowed them to prevail and for Gorbachev to be out, and after the wall came down, for Yeltsin and his people to be in. And so we even affected the politics as to who won. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's just a, it's really incredible to to look back and, and learn this uh, from you and also just in general seeing how effective it was and not having that full all blown out war. I, I'm, I'm grasping what you're saying. So then that well, relates let's, to. Let's stop for a second. Let, let, me just, let me just finish this thought. Sure. We'll take the readers where they hadn't necessarily wanted to go. So what's, what's the water sloshing in the tub? What's it look like today? The Russians decided they weren't big enough by themselves to engage us, and we didn't take them out completely. They were still wiggling. And they've gotten back up, dusted themselves off, it was never Reagan's intent to wipe them out to the last man. It wasn't. It was, this was about winning a fist fight as opposed to a fight to the death, and treating them with respect and trying to figure out a way to grow and be brothers and be happy ever after. Well, at the end of the day, that followed through somewhere fell between the cracks, and so now you've got a bear that is really pissed off. And it's out of hibernation, and it's ready to come take a swat at us and get us back for what's happened. But they realize that it didn't work by themselves. And one of the things in a conflict, uh, generals don't like to go into a battle with even odds. That's not the way to win a war. Mm -hmm. You go in with overwhelming odds in your favor. So what have the Russians done? They've engaged the Chinese and others 
to pick a side and the side being them. And now they're coming back and what are they, they took a, they took a page out of our book and they're engaging us on the financial, the oil, the energy, if you will, the politics, including how to affect even our politics like we affected theirs. And they are engaging us in this uh, asymmetrical warfare, even as we speak, and having uh, actually very good success. And even in the psychological side, remember, a lot of what we did was to convince the average Russian on the street that their government wasn't to be trusted and uh, Western was good. And for some of them, it was uh, helping the Pentecostals and the Catholics to see us as a uh, better brother and looking out for their best interests. And at other levels, it was making sure that the average Russian realized that uh, Playboy was available and was fun and Western music was cool. And we engaged them kind of whatever it took to get more of the numbers of their population to not trust their government, to not agree with or like their government, and to agree or like the Western culture, be it Western Europe or the U.S., <laughs> even in Japan, and to want to engage in that lifestyle. When, when, when the glass nose was going strong... They wanted Western cars. They wanted Mercedes. They wanted, you know, jeans. They wanted uh, a variety of uh, great Western foods from the supermarket and toilet paper. I, I remember visiting uh, a friend in one of those places that we don't weren't supposed to have been to at that time. And on his on his mantle above his fireplace is a roll of toilet paper. This is, you know, using that for like cleanup or dusting. What are you talking about? No. It's like on a holiday, once I might use a couple of pieces. What are you talking about? I mean, this, we're getting this story by, you know, bundles of it. Oh, no, it's the first roll I ever saw, saw in my life. We've seen like three or four rolls here in my whole life in the whole town. Wow. Okay. And, they, and that's, you know, something as simple as that. But when you're in that depraved of a situation things like that become, you know, pretty unique and cool and things like that. They wanted Western things, conveniences, and they knew what we were enjoying. They see the movies and stuff like that, and they knew what they weren't. Well, what, you know, and this is supposed to be good. Are you kidding me? But now let's look, come full circle. What's happening with what Russia Times is publishing right now? What's happening with the American people? We are becoming more and more aware every day of the lies that we are being uh, presented with, the scripts of lies that we are being uh, immersed in every single day. If you think that the Boston bombing was a real terrorist event, mm -hmm. you're right. Who was the author of it is a little different. And I'll tell you why. Think about this. Everybody in this audience, I would guess to a person, has watched police shows, detective shows, has watched crime scenes on the evening news. And they'll see bodies covered out there at the crime scene for 10, 12 hours, sometimes a whole day. Tents set up, every bullet hole, every dash in the, in the pavement where it might have been a strike by a bullet marked and cataloged and photographed and everything else. At the Boston bombing, you know how long it took to clear the bodies from the crime scene? Not exactly, no. I'm sure it was very quick. <laughs> Thirteen minutes. Oh my God. Thirteen minutes? <laughs> Wow. 13 minutes. Wow. We had a trial. We had a drama played out before us about an event that nothing that you have heard approaches even a morsel of the truth of what occurred there. 
We're being played. Mm-hmm. We're being scripted. Go look at Sandy Hook. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm hitting the holy grail here. Your listeners, <clears throat> probably to the 99 percentile, believe that Sandy Hook actually happened and a bunch of killed kids died and everything else. And I would propose to your listeners a very hard thing. I know that I can see people's eyeballs popping out of the head right now. Their freaking faces are twisting. I'm telling you, Sandy Hook never happened. I know it, man. I know it. It never happened. It was, if you want to get a better picture, go look at the movie Arlington Road. Arlington Road. Not Mm -hmm. just one person, but a whole community of people, crisis actors, Mm -hmm. people that have a certain agenda, concocting a situation to fit a script. Now, on Arlington Road, a real event took place. Well, a real event took place on 9-11. But was what you saw reality? Remember, uh, it, 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 it's, it's at multiple levels. Let's, let's go someplace else. Let's go to the beach in Libya, a place I have a lot of uh, understanding of. Remember all of the Christians that were marched down on the beach and beheaded mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. you know, half a year ago? Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> first off, if that video was truly accurate and was taken on the site, as it was broadcast over the news channels and the internet all across the world. The Muslim fighters taking those Christians down to the beach to behead them were eight feet tall. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What was going on? That was done in a studio. Yeah. You know, that's... You uh... are being scripted. You're being... You're being played. I hear you, man. I hear you, W. You you cannot believe 99% of what you're being told right now. You should second guess and triple guess everything you see and hear right now because even the truth is given to you with enough of a twist that you can't quite get to the real truth. It's a half-baked truth with some other stuff thrown in to play your emotions. Exactly. To play your judgment, to get you to do a certain thing a certain way. And I and and, and I'm saying this to your audience for a very specific reason. Even in the alternative media, these types of locations where we, we meet up in these underground churches of internet communications that we enjoy, we have to be careful Because even in our community, there is an intent and a desire to use our instinctive responses, our second guessing, to do their dirty work. We can be played to act, respond in certain ways. They've gamed this out. They've calculated. They've done the equation to see how we're going to react with certain ploys that they throw out there and the way we communicate between each other and say things. And then at the right moment, they can cause some of the more instantaneous nexus responders that are amongst us to say or do certain things and act impulsively, overly rapidly. For example, take the Ebola thing. Mm -hmm. I tried behind the scenes to communicate with a number of great folks that I had been in contact with in in this kind of a media format to say, it's not, this isn't the big one. And you need to take a deep breath and be a bit more paced because you're, you're going out on a limb as though, you know, this is the big one. It isn't on the numbers. It's not, there's multiple reasons why this isn't it. And if you, commit yourself, you'll lose credibility and you'll also pull a lot of people who just flat don't know, they trust you and you'll be played and it will damage your ability to function and to help 
your listeners further down the road. I know everybody wants to be first with the story and the understanding, but you need to take a deep breath. I know what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> and in some cases, uh, there was some, you know, favorable. In most cases, suddenly I'd become the enemy. I'm an evil guy. I'm part of the disinformation apparatus, and I can't be trusted now all of a sudden. Well, it's been over a year. Who was right? I hear you there, too. See, now, I find that always very interesting. To watch. It's like um, putting a watermelon out uh, and, and, uh, and waiting for all of the ants to just show up and, and, and uh, you know, attack the watermelon, etc. It's, it's a lure. You know, these... these um, you know, these uh, fantastic, if you will, these fantastic uh, moments, whether it's Ebola or, uh, you know, uh, whichever, pick your pick your favorite, uh, you know, media explosion and uh, and just watch the distraction happen. Watch, you know, that I watch it as as a bunch of ants that are, you know, feeding on a watermelon. And I, and I do I do wait uh, as much as I can. I am not uh, in a hurry to to bring things to the beginning uh, to or to get there first, because I, I know I'll make mistakes. And that is a, just true words and just just so you know w we've got uh, about a minute maybe two before the break and then we have a uh, about four minutes and then we'll we'll be back so i just wanted to let you know in case you needed a yeah i appreciate that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well <laughs> the the reality is is that we need to sometimes you do need to be able to be alive and able to respond rapidly but i'm just telling your listeners that um we need to also be let the buyer beware mm-hmm. be adults and we don't want to be chicken little we don't want to be uh scared of our own shadow we don't want to be screaming the sky is falling instantaneously uh, these players that are playing us for all that they're maneuvering us trying to herd us in certain directions most of what they're doing is the bark, and even the bite isn't going to get through your hide if you get right down to it. The problem is the stampedes that they can cause with those barks, that's where you can really get hurt if you're caught in the middle of a stampede. We need to be a bit more paced and measured because most of what they do, they don't want instantaneous changes because that's dangerous for them. They want it a little slower. All right, we'll be right back, everyone, after the break. I'm here with W, Intelligence Insider. This is Angela Black, and we'll see you in a few minutes.